Hi everybody, uh, Paul here again. This week we'll be looking at artificial neural networks. Uh, this is a really big area, but we're just going to have a bit of a, an overview of, a, overview of it in this section, and then we'll be looking at some simple or older approaches later. So this lecture we'll be looking at a background of artificial neural networks. We'll be later talking about perceptron, which is a really simple early method for neural networks. We'll show how this was transformed into something called multi-layer perceptrons, which are essentially the main what the main approaches are now based on. We'll look at a little bit about how we train uh, multi-layer perceptrons, and we'll be looking specifically at a very famous algorithm called backpropagation algorithm. Then we'll be looking at how we can use um, NIME to do to train some neural networks. And then lastly, we'll be looking at some practical considerations on using neural networks. So neural networks are a supervised machine learning or data mining technique, although there's lots of there's many, many kinds, and some of those are unsupervised. And we can use neural networks to do both classification and regression. And in general, it can learn a mapping between um, inputs and outputs to, assuming we have enough neurons, to any level of um, activity accuracy. So it's a very general and powerful approach to use. And it's very, very loosely modeled on mammalian brains, our brains, but very, very, very loosely, very, very simplistic. So there's many kinds of artificial neural networks, definitely more than 100. We're going to look at only um, a couple of kinds, one kind really, this in this lecture, and that's multi-layer perceptrons or perceptrons. There's other approaches. You will have heard of the more modern approaches like the deep learning neural networks. And we'll show sort of how that, we're not really going to go into them in this, in this class, but um, we'll sort of look at the bare bones of that. Uh, there's other methods. Cajonan networks are famous methods for doing um, visualization of data. There's convolutional neural networks, uh, which are a type of multi-layer perceptron that's used for images mainly and for sometimes text. Uh, there's an early method of neural networks called radial basis functions, which are really not used so much anymore. There's quite a big area of neural networks called recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks have a little memory in them, so that means that they can learn sequences of things. So they're often used for speech or, or text. Uh, there's methods called support vector machines, which um, we've already looked at before in this class. And support vector machines... Um, can be seen as a, as a sort of a type of neural network. Um, earlier on there were methods called competitive learning methods, um, uh, vector quantization. There's also a type of method called Boltzmann machines. And in fact, those methods, they're a statistical or probabilistic based approach to um, neural networks. And in fact, they came, they were used again later when we started to get into the deep learning neural networks. So there were deep learning belief networks and um, they use a type of Boltzmann machine called a restricted Boltzmann machine. Let's look at a very brief history of neural networks. So they started actually quite a long time ago, way before when you would expect them to have started. So back in 1943, McCulloch and Pitts developed a neural model. Couldn't learn at this stage, but it was a simple neural model. And it could sum up binary inputs and it could produce an output that was one if the threat if the sum of inputs was over a particular threshold otherwise it was zero and what McCulloch and Pitts found was that a model like this a really simple model could be used to model um, AND gates OR gates and NOT gates and this was um, a really useful early result there was another early result by a guy called Donald Hebb called Hebb's rule and um, what he said was that when the axon of a cell A, so this is sort of the, I guess, in a, in a real neuron, the output, when the axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B, and it repeatedly takes part in firing cell B, then some kind of growth or metabolic process or change happens in either A or B, he wasn't quite sure, so that A becomes better at exciting cell um, B. What this is about is essentially a learning rule. It's a way to use neural networks to learn. The idea is that if cell A is 
um, is repeatedly um, causing cell B to fire, then cell A becomes better at causing cell B to fire. So a guy called Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 was inspired by both these ideas, McCulloch and Pitt's simple um, binary model of a neuron and Hebb's rule to um, build something called a perceptron. And the perceptron was really a simplified model of neural learning that used both of these ideas and it was implemented in hardware because this is sort of really early computing days. And we'll see a little bit later how the perceptron works. Uh, so then later in 1968, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert wrote this famous book called Perceptrons. And they showed that, this is a little bit of a spoiler for later, they showed that the perceptrons weren't able to learn anything that was not linearly separable. And um, this is said to have caused or to usher in the first AI winter. Essentially, because no one could learn how to, because neuron, neural networks couldn't solve these really simple problems, um, there was not much funding or, or work done in them. And it, this, this existed, or this was a problem for almost um, 20 years. So the second sort of um, stage of the, of the AI neural network story started it with um, the development of a method called backpropagation. So this was um, independently discovered by several different people and rediscovered over time. But Paul Werbos um, in 1974 was the first, was said, he said to be the first person that worked this out. And this was a way to train neural networks of more than and, and of more than um, one layer, uh, and because of that, it could solve the, it could get past this problem of um, of uh, not being able to solve linearly, non-linearly separable problems. And we're going to look at this later. Probably the name that's, or the names that are that are most associated with backpropagation, are, though, are Rumel Hart, uh, Hinton, and Williams. So in 1986, they wrote a really nice paper that um, described quite clearly how backpropagation worked. Now, because neural networks could be trained, there was a lot of work put into them. So some of the edited highlights over the next, um, next section was uh, in 1989, uh, Jan LeCun, working at um, Bell Labs, um, developed uh, convolutional neural networks, and these were used to, um, to, to solve image processing problems. Uh, Weibull, uh, and some other colleagues, including Hinton, you'll see the name Hinton coming out, Jeffrey Hinton coming out many times, uh, developed these methods called time delay neural networks and they could learn sequences of things. Uh, in 1995, Tesauro developed a method called TD Gammon. So TD stands for, um, is one of the reinforcement learning, TD learning, one of the reinforcement learning um, methods, and he combined neural networks with reinforcement learning to play backgammon and this backgammon playing program could beat experts so this is a really good example of an early uh, example of, of where AI could could beat humans at, at jobs. Then in 1991 Hockreiter um, talked about this vanishing or exploding gradients problem. This is an issue which essentially says that if you have many layers maybe even only about 10, 10 layers of um, of in the neural network, backpropagation can't be used to to train them anymore. Either the the um, derivatives of the error with respect to the weights vanish or they explode. Because of this, large neural networks couldn't be built, and in particular, we couldn't solve um, problems that had a, that needed a memory. So the time delay neural networks and the recurrent neural networks that followed from that didn't work very well because um, uh, they change the problem to be neural networks that have many layers. So this is said to have ushered in the second AI winter. So from about the early 90s, it was difficult again to get funding in neural networks and to get papers published. That was until about 2006 when Jeffrey Hinton started uh, worked out a way to train neural networks that had many layers. And what he what he developed with these ideas was this method called deep belief networks, and they used a, they used uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. These are we talked about the Boltzmann machines much earlier. They're like a probabilistic approach to neural networks. So he 
using restricted bolts and machines and building them up into a deep belief network, he could build these larger neural networks that could solve problems that the previous backpropagation neural networks couldn't solve. Then around 2009, people started using GPUs, graphical programming processing units, to um, train neural networks. This meant that um, they could be sped up and trained much faster. Uh, and there's been a few other kinds of uh, breakthroughs that came through. So in 2010, Gloro and Bengio, Bengio is another name that you'll see quite a lot, they developed um, a method, a different type of activation function called ReLU, um, rectified linear unit, rectified linear units, and um, these were simpler than the sigmoid um, neurons that we'll, we're going to see a little bit later. Also, in 2012, Hinton and his group developed um, Dropout, which was a way of um, making networks a little bit more robust and um, could train better. Then, in, also in 2012. Uh, AlexNet came out. AlexNet um, was really interesting because it was an approach that um, was able to solve the ImageNet um, problem. So ImageNet was a competition to do image processing and classification of a large um, industry, in image data set and AlexNet was able to solve this problem using convolutional neural networks, ReLU, GPUs and Dropout and he was able to beat all the competitors by a large margin. So the error rate for his approach was 15.3%. The next closest error rate was 26.2%. So this really showed that um, convolutional neural networks and these deep, these deep networks could, could really solve um, human competitive problems. Uh, so this really ushered in the, the deep learning um, craze that's happening at the moment. Um, and this is sort of where the, where, where the state of the art is now, or a little bit past this. So deep learning is all about having lots of training data, uh, using parallel computation, using the GPUs, and having these smart, scalable smart algorithms. And they're really producing methods that, can, that are state of the art in many, many areas. OK, that's where we're going to. Let's wind back a bit and we'll look at um, just an example of what a, a multi-layer perceptron looks like. So you can see here um, the circles are, no, are neurons and um, the connections are the links between the neurons. And the idea is that um, we can represent knowledge across this and learn a, and learn a mapping between the left-hand side, which are the input neurons, uh, to the, to the right-hand side, which are the output neurons. So on the left-hand side, we have our input neurons. These ones map to the input attributes in our data set. So here we'd have two input attributes. These neural networks can only take numeric inputs, so we would need to transform the data from categorical into numeric. On the right-hand side, we've got our output neurons. We can have more than one, but here I'm just showing one. These ones map to your output attributes, so uh, potentially a number that we're trying to predict if it's a regression problem, or several of them if we're trying to do a classification problem, and we'll see how that works later. And then the ones in the middle are called hidden neurons. And these ones aren't seen from the outside, but they can learn. So everything, um, our hidden neurons and our, outside and our output neurons can both learn. And learning is all about setting the weights which are associated with these connections. So we can see the connections between the neurons. The, this is a, essentially a strength between the neurons. And you can think of it as the amount of information that flows through from one neuron to the next. And in the what we'll see later, the backpropagation um, learning algorithm, or any kind of neural network learning algorithm, we have, we set these weights to get particular mappings between our inputs and our output. There's also usually bias nodes, which are which are always on, and they contribute to the to the learnable neurons, and they have weights. So these are additional weights that we that we have in our neural network. So here's an example of just one neuron, J, uh, which has several input neurons, so um, n input neurons, x1 to xn, and associated with each of the input neurons is some weight. So the weight um, 1J, or all the way up to the weight nj. And when we want to calculate the output of neuron J, so what 
what, what it produces, we need to first off calculate the weighted input into the neuron, and then we need to apply a transfer function. So the weighted input is just we multiply x1 times the weight all the way up to xn times the weight and sum them all together. So it's just the dot product between the weights and the x's. And then we, with that, um, that sum, we push that through a transfer function uh, and that produces an output and then that's the output of neuron j. There's lots of different transfer functions you can use. So there's the ReLU one that we mentioned earlier, but often what people use is a sigmoid or in the, in the multi-layer perceptrons, the earlier multi-layer perceptrons and the ones that we'll be looking at, we often use sigmoid function. Uh, so the sigmoid function looks like this. When the input is very positive, it produces um, towards a 1. When the input is quite negative, it produces towards a 0. So the sigmoid neurons can only produce a value between 0 and 1. There's other um, activation functions like tan, h, relu that we talked about before. But here we're just going to look at sigmoid. So when we're running our network, we need to somehow set those weights. So the output of the neural network is controlled by two things. One, the architecture. Which neurons we have here, how many hidden layers we have, how many neurons in the hidden layer. And it's also controlled by the weights. So how do we set the, the, the neural net, the topology um, we need to set up ourselves, but the weights are automatically um, produced using this back propagation algorithm, at least in the multi layer perceptions we're going to be looking at. The idea is you give it a training set, which is the which has the known which the in, has the inputs and the known outputs, and back propagation will find the weights that map between the two of them. Um, back propagation is often controlled by two parameters. There's one called a learning weight, which is eta. And there's a momentum which helps with the training sometimes. And we'll look at this a little bit later. Uh, but that's it for right now.